So it's my pleasure to introduce your host for this event, Commissioner of Securities and Insurance, Montana State Auditor Monica J. Lindeen. Uh, Commissioner Lindeen was elected in 2008 and re-elected to a second term in 2012. She has made it her mission over her years as State Auditor to protect Montana's securities and insurance consumers through education, fairness, and transparency, which is one of the reasons we're here tonight doing Penny. During Commissioner Lindeen's tenure, her office has returned more than $374 million to investment in insurance consumers. Thank you, Monica, for hosting tonight's event, and I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, everyone. It's so great to see a full room on such a beautiful uh, Montana summer evening. I uh, really want to, uh, again, <clears throat> thank you for coming to join us at the Penny Workshop. As Laura said, this is our first, what we call, mini Penny. We did our very first one in Missoula, and it was a day-long event, and it was a great success. Uh, but certainly when you're doing a, a day-long event, it takes more speakers, <laughs> more resources, more sponsors, and we thought we'd try a mini Penny and see how it goes. And it looks like so far we got a great turnout, so we really are looking forward to your feedback. Um, we wanted to do something special, obviously, for Montana's women because, frankly, Montana women think, um, spend, and save money differently than men do. And so last January, as I said, we put on that uh, full-day conference in Missoula. We had over 200 women that attended, and they gave us a whole bunch of great feedback. So we're hoping tonight you're getting the best of the best <laughs> from that day-long conference that we put on. Um, anyway, back to my thank yous. Obviously, thank each and every one of you for coming tonight. Um, I know I often find myself incredibly busy moving from one responsibility to another, just as all of you do as women. And uh, it's often hard to take time to, you know, kind of stop and think about taking care of yourself. And I just had this conversation back there with an old friend of mine. So thank you for coming today and taking care of yourself this evening. I also want to thank our sponsors and our host, with whom out this workshop, um, without this workshop would not have happened without them. Obviously, Exploration Works, thank you for letting us use their, their facility. And then the Investor Protection Trust, um, they are one of our sponsors for the advertisers and for also our materials. Since 1993, the Investor Protection Trust has worked with states all across the country to provide independent, objective investor education, which obviously is needed by all Americans to make informed investment decisions. All funding from the Investment Protection Trust comes from voluntary and court order contributions from criminals who have actually committed investment fraud. So when my office is actually working one of these investment fraud cases, once we have gone through the process of uh, um, getting hopefully restitution from that criminal and also getting fines paid and so forth. Many times we will ask them to make a contribution to the Investor Protection Trust. So it's the criminals who are paying for this. <laughs> we really appreciate that because we can't thank them for much else. Uh, the Montana Women's Foundation, special thanks to Jen Mule and Kelsey Mahoney. Um, actually, the Montana Women's Foundation is hosting an event tomorrow night. Um, here in Helena, it's going to be at the uh, brew house downstairs, just over here, and they're going to host an event to talk about closing the gender pay gap, and obviously how important that is to each and every one of us. So if you have time, 5.30 p.m. at the brew pub house downstairs, um, go check it out. Thank you to all of our speakers and organizations that you'll get a chance to meet this evening who have donated their time and to share their expertise with us this evening. Thank you to my staff. Um, certainly, yeah, I think you've already met Laura, but there's others floating around. You may have met some at the front door. Um, this would not happen without them. They're absolutely incredible. So we call this workshop Penny because obviously building your wealth happens slowly, and even you could say one penny at a time. And I wanted to do this workshop, obviously, for women. And I know we have unique strengths, and we also as women face unique challenges when it comes to managing our money. Um, when it comes to talking about finances, studies show that only one in three women actually feel they're on track when it comes to planning or saving for retirement. Studies also find that women 
feel confident in their knowledge of day-to-day -day finances and they admit challenges in trying to meet their long-term financial goals. And each month, women put a higher proportion of their paycheck away for retirement and they're often smarter investors than men, but many have smaller investment, or excuse me, smaller retirement accounts than their counterparts. And this happens obviously because of the pay gap is one of the bigger reasons that that happens. Um, this information is obviously a little troubling when you recognize that women are more likely to live longer than men. So today we're gonna address some of those challenges head on with a few tools to help you make some smart financial decisions and then we're going to talk about investing 101, we're gonna talk about avoiding investment fraud, and about making retirement decisions. So hopefully along the way, um, what you'll learn from some of the personal stories you'll hear from our panelists about when and even how to find professional financial help and how to take risk in your life. I know myself, um, if I could just briefly tell you my personal story, um, you know, I was kind of the normal wife I got married, I had a daughter, um, my husband had a really good job, was putting retirement away. Um, I'd had some small jobs here and there, but had absolutely no retirement, obviously, um, and didn't even think about it when I was younger, and it wasn't until I got older I really thought about those things. But, you know, at one point, I actually started a business. I guess it'll be, it's been almost 20 some years ago since I started one of the very first internet service providers in the state of Montana with my brothers and a couple of other friends in Billings, Montana. And uh, the first year, we all went without any pay, because you have to, <laughs> sometimes when you're a business startup. And certainly when the time came to start getting a salary for the next three or four years before we sold the business, um, even though I was equal to my brothers in terms of the amount of work that I did as a general manager and many other hats that I wore, um, I always took less money. And I took less money because I thought, well, my husband has a good job, and you know, my brothers and my two male partners, they need to make more money because they have a family. Well, I was wrong. I was devaluing myself and my work as a result. And uh, had I come to an event like this years ago, I might have understood that. So. As you'll hear later on, if you ever, especially you younger gals, if you ever decide to start a business, think about that. Uh, so with that, I learn something every single day, and uh, I continue to when it comes to money, money matters. And I know, I hope you will learn something as well. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, this is our Investing 101 presentation, which is obviously designed to talk to you about the basics of investing. Terry Cohey is our presenter. Terry, come on up. Uh, Terry actually retired from D.A. Davidson after working as a financial consultant for 20 years. And during her time, she served as the branch manager of the Helena office. Uh, she served on the board of the Davidson companies and was the founder of the Women's Advisory Council. And prior to her work as a financial consultant, Terry served in state government for nearly 20 years. Uh, she worked as a researcher for legislative council, an analyst for the, uh, the budget office, bureau chief of the Department of Revenue, and chief of staff to Governor Ted Schwinden. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Terry, and thank you for coming, Terry. First of all, I am delighted to be here. Um, I love talking about investment. I know it's kind of like having your teeth grow for a lot of people, but I think it's fascinating. And I particularly enjoy talking to women about it because I think that you do a great job of investing. So what I want to do is talk about some of the tools that are available to you and some tricks that might help your retirement grow faster. There's a lot to cover here, so I want to say if you have questions, we'll take some afterwards and I'll be around during the network time if I can answer any questions. So we want to start here. Monica's already talked about that, but why does a financial plan matter? Well, obviously it matters for many, many reasons, but one of the big ones is that you're gonna live a long time. This says that you'll probably live to 81, that's the average, and a man will live to be 76. I'm looking out in this room and I'm seeing healthy people. Plan on living into your 90s and probably to 100. So you've got a lot of years in retirement. 
Secondly, many of you already manage your own finances, but even if you work with a partner on that, chances are 85% or more that at some point in your life, you're gonna be solely responsible for your financial planning. So start now to understand it. And then as Monica said, women tend to work fewer years or less in those jobs, so their social security is less, about 24% less than men receive. So we need to talk about financial plans. You all know that there are a million reasons to have a financial plan, but let me go through a few of them so you can be thinking not only of retirement, but everything else. First of all, how do you protect yourself against financial risk? We're gonna talk about fraud later, but there's all types of financial risk. How do you eliminate personal debt? How do you uh, pay for the cost of raising children, sending them to college, helping with the wedding, buying cars for you and kids, buying a home, and being able to retire when and how you want to, in what style. And of course, it doesn't stop there. We all know that there are questions about long-term health care, caring for your aging parents, and many of us want to leave legacies for our children or for charities. So there are many, many reasons to have a financial plan. But there's some obstacles to having a financial plan. Four are listed, procrastination, spending habits, inflation, and taxes. I'm gonna talk about procrastination and taxes in a minute, but I wanna talk now about spending habits. I would argue that most women are excellent money managers. They're having to raise children and manage finances on a daily level. The difficulty is that many of us put other people's needs before our own. I certainly know that I had was a single mom raising two boys. Retirement didn't seem nearly as important as buying tennis shoes for the next basketball game. But the problem is if you don't take care of yourself and you don't start early, it's gonna be much, much harder to do. Your goal should be to put 20% of your salary away every year for every year you're working. With a reasonable rate of return, that means that you would be able to spend 80% of your current income in retirement and then with Social Security, you'd be able to maintain your standard of living. But obviously, 20% sounds like a big number. Now, are any of you in the room state employees? I would assume there are quite a bit. You have a head start on this because with the contribution that's pulled out of your paycheck and what the state puts in, you're already almost at 16%. That is incredibly generous in terms of what most Montanans have for pensions. So that's great, but even for you, again, that's only 16%, you need 20%. And for those of you hired after 2007, you're not going to get a 3% cost of living inflator on your pension, you're going to have a 1%. So even though you have the possibility of a very nice pension, it is very important to save. But most people in Montana and the country do not have pension plans anymore. Well, those kind of went the way of a lot of good things. So you're responsible really now for coming up with your own plan. Uh, Social Security was never designed to produ produce more or provide more than 30 or 40 percent and you're gonna have a social security expert here a minute to talk about that, of your retirement needs. So you're responsible for coming up with the other. other. Um, here's some tips, and looking out at the crowd, I would say most of you are beyond this level, but I certainly know when I started out, the thought of having an extra $100 a month to put into savings was a lot to think about. If you just think about that, foregoing a latte every day is $100 a month. And if you put that into a retirement pension plan and earned, or I mean, excuse me, an investment plan and earned 8% a year from, 20, from when you were 25 to 65, you'd have nearly 400,000 in your IRA or your uh, Roth when you retired.
And then if you put every part of every raise you got into a investment plan, so say at age 40, you started putting an extra $200 a month in. Now you're only gonna do that for 25 years and it won't have as long to grow, but that will bring you another 240,000 into your retirement plan. So things like that, that don't seem like they're huge at the time, if you do it consistently and over a long period of time, it is amazing. Um, another thing to think about is inflation. Right now inflation is minuscule. You know, we don't think it matters that it much anymore, but during our lifetime, inflation will come back at some point. But even if you assume a very modest 2% inflation rate, if you wanna spend 50,000 in retirement, by the 20 years from now, it's gonna take $78,000 buy what costs 50,000 now. So the bottom line is it's important to contribute early to your retirement plan and to keep doing it the entire time you're working because that's what's going to build a comfortable retirement for you. Oh, I finally got it right, <laughs> totally changed. So let's give you some examples of how procrastination costs you. Let's first look at Anne on the left here. So she invests $100 a month from age 25 to 35, and she gets 10% rate of return. I hope we all get 10% rate of return. That's <laughs> kind of, that would be nice. But in any case, if that were true, um, she would have put in $12,000. Sally, on the other hand, didn't start investing till 35, but she did it for 30 years. So she put the 100 in, so she put in 36,000. Who do you think had more money at the end? Who thinks that uh, Anne would have more money? Okay, and who thinks that Sally would have more money? See, I knew you guys were really smart. Okay, so Anne, who started early and stopped, would only have 406,000. Uh, would have 406,000 in hers, and Sally, who put in three times as much, would have less because she lost those 10 years of compound interest. So, an important thing. Now let's look at the next slide, and this shows it even more vividly, I think. So let's look at the three folks. Bill is the bottom line, okay? And he put in 5,000 each year from 35 to 65. So he, but he didn't start until he was 35. So at the end, he put in 150,000. Then Susan, the middle one, um, let's see, she invested 5,000 between 25 and 35, but then she stopped, but she started early. Chris, the top line, is the one who did it right. He put in 5,000 per year, starting at 25, going to age 65. So he put in 200,000, but look at the differences. Bill put in, let's see, 50,000, and he came out with 540,000. Uh, Susan put in 50,000 and came out with over 600,000. But Chris, who put in 200,000, came up with more than $1.1 million, which is enough to fund a very, very comfortable retirement. So obviously, the earlier you can start and the more consistently, the better. Now let's look at the markets. And with the Brexit vote tomorrow, you may see some really good volatility tomorrow. Um, but the thing is, it's so difficult. You're saving seriously. This money is hard to get for you. It's hard to put in there, and then you put it in, and boom, the market goes down. So you say, I don't really want to invest in stocks. I want to save something safe. The problem is you're putting yourself in another risk by being overly safe, because you're of the generation that there's probably not a pension plan. You're responsible for your own retirement, and if you're getting a 1% return on a CD, that's not gonna get you there. So, but it's particularly true right now because Investors today have lived through two major market upsets. The 2000 through 2002 tech bust took the market down by 42%. The housing crisis and the Great Recession in 2008, 37%. So the volatility is very fresh in our minds and continues. You know, every day we go up in the market and then we go down. But if you step back and look at what's called the mountain chart, 
This is showing money invested in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is 35 of the biggest stocks. How the peaks and valleys, but the overall obviously is an upward turn. To put it in, quantify it, over the last 66 years, U.S. stocks have averaged 11.5% over the period. Treasury bills, which currently pay less than 1%, average 3.5% over the same period. So if you'd taken $100 and put it in the, in the Dow Jones, or actually the S&P 500, 500 stocks in 1928, and that's right before the big crash, you would have $260,000 today. However, if you had taken that same $100 and put it in treasury bills, you would have 2,000 today. So just the magic of compounding is critical to your retirement plan. I wanted to point out some of the handouts that are downstairs. I saw some of you picking them up. These are excellent. The first one that I point out here is the basics of investing in stock. It covers a lot of the material that I just talked about and gives you a really good overview of the terms used, what to expect from stocks, how volatility works, and so on. So I would really, really recommend you take a look at that. Um, now let's talk about making your money work for you. Let's review why we want to do that and the reasons I think are really obvious. We don't want to work our whole lives. You want to look forward to a good retirement. Many people, or some people, are wealthy, can expect wealth from their parents or so on, but most people, <laughs> I cannot remember to hold the microphone in front of them, most people um, have to build social or their financial security slowly, carefully, and over a long period of time. So what ye, we need to do is figure out how to make your money work for you as hard as it was for you to make the money. So there are two ways of doing that, and I'm gonna have you switch to the next one because I think it makes it easier. Is there one more after that that has debt and securities? Nope, I'll talk you through it. Okay, so uh, there, debt, Debt is what we all understand by like CDs, bonds. You give the bank or whoever your money, they pay you for having it, hopefully. We know in Germany now you pay them to have your money, but you get a small interest rate and at the end of a fixed period of time, you get your principal back and you get interest. That's called debt instruments. The second sort is securities. There you become an owner in the company through shares. You don't have a guarantee of when the money will come or if it will come, but you buy it based on the belief that there's going to be growth in that. And then you sell the asset when you need the money. So again, common debt investments are savings, CDs, money markets, or bonds. Let me tell you about how bonds have performed. In general, over the last 35 years, long-term bonds have produced about 3.5%. Right now, the 30-year U.S. Treasury is just at 3%. It's historically very low. But during that period, bonds were positive 30 out of the last 35 years. So you say, well, not too bad. It's how did I lose money in bonds? But actually, if interest rates rise sharply, you can lose money in bonds. But 30 out of the 35 years, you, you made money. But interestingly enough, US stocks, which instead of paying 3% per year, averaged 11.5% per year, were actually positive 29 out of the 35 years. Now, the swings were much higher than in the bonds, but actually the number of years of positive returns are very, very similar. So again, what I would like to point out to you is one of the handouts downstairs, mutual funds and ETFs, and ETFs are just exchange traded funds. It's just a different way of organizing a mutual fund, really. But this book is great because it'll talk you through how to choose among the, what is it, 9,000 mutual funds out there, what you're looking for, what a balanced portfolio looks like, and so on. One thing I would really, really emphasize is look at the fees. Just like the compounding of interest is magic, if it's being taken away in fees, that's magic, but in the wrong direction. And if you're looking at, either debt securities or stocks mutual funds, the fees can vary as much as in an index fund, 
can be as low as a quarter of 1%. Like the state and like the state deferred comp, I believe, is 0.47%, so very low cost of investing. On the other hand, some managed mutual funds can cost as much as 3%. So you can imagine the difference over 10 years, a quarter of a percent or 3%. So be very careful to ask when you're investing, what are the expenses and what are you getting for the fees you're paying? It can well be worth it, but perhaps not. Next one, I think. Okay. Now, the important one of the big things as well as choosing your investments is where is the best place to put them. These are all investment vehicles for retirement, but it very much depends on your age, where you're employed, what your tax bracket is, what is the best one for you. So I'm going to go through these really quickly, but the retirement panel has some experts that can you know, hone in and help you know which are the best ones for you. Traditional IRAs were one of the first ones, and even though it says after-tax investments, in general, IRAs were set up to be pre-tax investments. For people who don't, aren't covered by a pension plan, all the money they put in goes in pre-tax, it grows tax-deferred, and then you pay tax when you take it out. Okay. It can go in after tax if you are covered by a pension plan and you earn more than $98,000, you cannot, for a married couple, you cannot make a tax deductible IRA contribution. I would argue you'd be nuts to do so. There are other better vehicles. So this is a classic case where your tax bracket and your status as in what sort of plan you are makes a huge difference. Traditional IRAs are like Roth IRAs. If you're 50, uh, if you're under 50, you can put in 5,500 a year. If you're 50 or older, you can put in 6,500 a year. Like almost all retirement plans, there's a stiff, stiff penalty for taking it out early. It's 10% before age 59 in most cases. There are a few exceptions, but in general. Um, now, Roths were developed later, and the idea here was that you put in money after tax, but it grew tax deferred, and very importantly, it was tax free when you can take it out. So just imagine these examples we've had of people putting in $100 for 40 years per month. To have all that money tax free when you retire is a huge benefit. And so these sort of investments make great sense for young people who are going to be investing for a long period of time and may be in a much lower tax bracket now than they're going to be in retirement. That's the classic person for whom a Roth makes sense. Now, not everybody's eligible for Roths. That um, if you're under 117,000 in gross, uh, adjusted gross income, and you're a single person, you can contribute to a Roth. For a married couple filing jointly, it's 184,000. So practical matter, most of us can contribute to a Roth and get the advantage of the tax-free growth. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know it's the middle of the presentation. Sure. My question is, if you have two people who are the same age, you put in the exact same amount of money into the first IRA you showed versus the Roth IRA. Is there a difference in the amount of the tax that they actually pay? It, well, it, that's, that's why it's so tricky because it depends on, for the, the person who puts in the traditional IRA, what was the dollar value of the deduction they got? If they were in a 25% federal bracket and a 6% state, then every dollar they put in only cost them 70 cents to put in. But then when they retire, what bracket are they in? If they're in a 15% bracket, it made sense to do. If they're in a 39% bracket, maybe not so much. So it's really a tricky, tricky question. And for a lot of people, I know for myself, I had various sorts of retirement plans at various points in my life because your circumstances change. And that to me is one of the great reasons of having a financial plan and updating them a lot. Because also the federal law changes too, you know, Roths didn't exist for a long time. So it's not an easy answer. I mean, it's a great question, but it really depends. One other thing about Roths, 
If you're working, like many of us may want to, until we're in our 70s, with a traditional IRA, even if you're working, you cannot put in money after 70 and a half, and you have to start pulling it out, even if you don't want to use it then. In a Roth, if you're still working, you can continue to put in, and here's the great part, you never have to take your Roth money out. So say you die and leave your Roth, your children can inherit it tax-free. They do not have to pay money when they take it out. Now, they could be subject to a state tax if your estate is over several million, but for income tax purposes, you can pass that on tax-free. So Roths have a whole bunch of benefits. Now, the next couple ones we want to talk about, 403B and 401K, and there are other ones, SEPs and SIMPLES, are em employer-type plans. They're also retirement vehicles, but they're uh, only certain people can use them. 403Bs are generally used by teachers, by um, people in the medical field, and people in the university system. In most, or in many cases, people have a pension plan, like the teachers have the teacher's retirement system, but then they can save an additional amount pre-tax in the 403B, and it's a big amount of money. If you're under 50, you can put up to 18,000 a year in tax deductible, like any teacher could do that, right? And uh, 24,000 if you're 50 or older. But this can be a really great vehicle for someone who's late in a teaching career, has disposable income and can save for the last three years, for example, I'm gonna cut my taxes drastically and I'm gonna get a bunch put away. So a 403B could be a really useful thing. 401ks are private employers' plans. They can be of several sorts. The sort we often think about is you put in a ma um, and then they match. So that's there's the employer employee contribution and the employer match. Unfortunately, many, many employers have cut the match. So in, for a lot of people, it's the place that they can put their money in pre-tax, have it grow tax deferred and come out and be taxable, but there's no match. Um, again, you can put in large amounts, the 18,000 and the 24,000. And in most cases you have, um, limited options in what you can invest in. Those are getting better. There's been quite a fuss because a lot of the employers did not have great options and had high fees, but that is getting better. It uh, says might be portable because um, like if you move from one employer to the other, one in, the new employer may not accept your assets in the plan. If that happens, don't be concerned. Roll it to an IRA that you control. I would argue the worst thing you can do is leave scattered pots of money all over the place because when you come to retirement and try and pull it all together, you're gonna have to go back and research the company you had the 401k with 20 years ago, who do you call, et cetera, et cetera. So keep track of those things. When you leave a job, either roll it to your new job or roll it to an IRA. And you can have just one IRA that accepts them all. So now we've talked about you know, why you want to invest, uh, 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 op, you know, vehicles for investing, but how do you manage your risk? So the third handout I wanted you to look at is this one. And again, I think it's excellent. It's getting help with your investments. This helps you decide, do you need investment advice? Or if you feel that you have the time and the inclination and you want to invest yourself, what sort of resources will you need? This booklet helps you look at the different types of financial advisors and see how you can check out their credentials. So I would definitely recommend looking at that. And another one while I'm talking about all the great handouts they have downstairs, this one would be kind of a wrap up one. This looks at how, brings all these together, but kind of gives you a roadmap of how to do it. And on page seven of this, they even have uh, portfolios that you may want to consider at various times in your life, the, the mixture of stocks and bonds. So I would argue this is a good one to look at too. Now we're going to talk about that ever popular topic of taxes. And this is back, I think, to Monica's question. It can take and make an amazing difference. So let's say that you had 5,500 you invested every year for 20 years and you was earning 8%. Okay, if it were in a tax-deferred 
or tax exempt plan, you would have 272,000 at the end of that 20 years. However, if it were in a taxable account and you were in the 25% federal bracket and you had to pay taxes every year on the growth on it, you'd only have 197,000. So taxes make a huge difference. But as we've talked about, it's, there's no one size fits all. It really depends upon your tax bracket at the time you start, where you think you'll end up, what your time frame is, et cetera. And I think, again, that's something that the retirement panel will speak to more fully, the sorts of things you should look at. So let's get started. Uh, first, we talked about you know talking to a financial ad advisor. I would recommend that even if you think you might want to do investing on your own, go talk to a CPA, go talk to a financial consultant. Most of them will give you a complimentary consultation so they can tell you what services they can provide and how they would work with you. And it could be that you would learn something from that and feel like, yes, this is what I want to do. Or it could be that you feel through study, inclination, interest, you want to do it yourself. If you do that, be wary of the sites you use on the internet to do it because they're a bunch of really bad ones. But there are a bunch of excellent ones. One thing I would recommend at the last Penny Conference, the um, Extension Agency came and spoke and they have great handouts. It's under um, msuextension.org. We got it downstairs. Downstairs, they are just superb, okay? Another great site is Wiser, W-I-S-E-R, and that is Women's Institute for Secure Retirements. Again, excellent material. Another good one is LearnVest.com. All of those are good. So I guess the thing I would leave you with is take advantage of the system you're in. If you're in a 401k and or a simple or SEP that the um, employer has a match, at the very, very minimum, give from your salary the minimum, the amount to get their maximum. Because you're just throwing away money if you don't do that. Secondly, if you are figured are covered by um, PERS, TRS, know that that's not quite enough and figure out if deferred comp or a Roth would be more advantageous for you to work with. And then I guess the thing is, Work hard to make that magic 20% per year of your salary because that's putting it into a retirement plan. That's going to make a huge difference. And then lastly, make sure your money is working as hard for you as you are working to get it in there. So be wise with your investments. So, and that's not hard at all. So any questions I could answer, I'd be glad to. Hi. Um, I recently watched a program on investments and it talked about some folks who are designated as financial advisors do not technically have to act in the fiduciary interest of the folks that they're serving. And I was just wondering, you know, if we do go to meet with a financial advisor or a company, what are the questions we should ask to find out if they will represent us or not? we were talking about covers exactly that point. And I would say the state auditor's office is a great resource for that because they have ways of checking on the, the actual, every single person you would be speaking with, what they've done in the past, what their record looks like. So there are tools that are gonna let you know very clearly what sort of service you'll be getting. Okay, so I'm at getting towards the retirement part. I'm, and if, I have a question about, um, if you come into a large sum of money, say by whatever reason, would it be beneficial at my age, because I'm close to it, to put it in a mutual fund and not just let it sit in the bank, but invest it in a mutual fund and then, because I can still contribute to my IRA until I turn 70, I think. Right. Or would it be better to maybe buy an annuity with it? Annuities <laughs> can have a place in the world, but annuities generally have extremely high fees and they lock you in. They are generally to the insurance company's benefit rather than yours. What I would recommend is think about when you're gonna use the money. If this money is truly for retirement and you're gonna use it over the next 
20 years, then I would say a diversified mutual fund package is a great idea for you, but use part of the money to max out your tax deductible things you can do. And then the amount you can't get in because they're over the limit, do in the diversified mutual fund package. Money that you'll need within the next three to five years probably should not be in longer term investments that have much risk because you're gonna need the money before then. What's your opinion about life cycle managed funds? The target date? Target date. Yeah. <laughs> I should run out there and do it. <laughs> um, I think they can be apps really, and I think they're a great concept because many of us are just too busy to do that. The difficulty has been that they have had pretty high fees and what people found to their horror in the downturns is that they were a little more aggressively invested than they thought they would be because the, the funds were fighting for returns. So, but one of the good things of having the apple cart unturned in 2008 is I think target funds target date funds have gotten much better. But check the long term on them to see how they're behaving. See, I knew it. You guys have had enough of having your teeth drilled. <laughs> I'll do one more. Um, so folks are talking a lot about Vanguard index funds. And I don't have much experience with that, but I was wondering if you could give us just an overview and if that's something that you would recommend. Vanguard, first of all, is an excellent fund company. They, um, they are the, the leaders in index funds. They're now other index funds, but they really started it. What that means is nobody's trying to pick the stocks that they think are gonna do better than others. You're buying a replica of the whole universe of stocks. So it's mostly like the S&P 500, for example. In general, um, index funds do best in up markets. In sideways or down markets, managed funds tend to do better. But having said that, there's enormous variability. So what I personally do is I have both. And I'm on the board of investments that does the works on the state pensions, and we do the same thing. We have passive investments and we have active investments. So if you're looking to invest primarily in large cap US stocks, then I would say an index fund is a great idea because you're gonna have low fees. But if you want to have small cap or mid cap or a different one, that may be a place that a manager can, through picking stocks and acumen, get you a better result. So I would say a mixture. All right, let's say thank you to Terry.